Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Um, this is uh, this is Brooks. We'll be getting started in a couple of minutes. I also want to do a quick mic check to make sure that uh, everything is properly set up over for uh, CJ's stream. So tell me, can everybody hear me? And is it all is it all sounding good? Awesome, perfect. Okay, with that, let's uh, switch on over to our primer. Oh man, okay. Looks like it put uh, my secondary display up again. Seems to happen every single time that I try to uh, do a new new system. Let's quickly switch over here to the terminal it would be kind of tough for me to look over an obs and do all of my coding over there so mirror apply all right how's everything looking actually looks a little bit weird boxed Let's fix that too. Uh, let's see, 1920 by 1200, uh, 1920 by 1080. That's what we want. All right, this should be looking much better. Yes, and I have a checklist. Um, all right, so. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Brooks Builds, um, hosted by CJ's Coding Garden. Uh, I this is something that I've been hoping to do for a while now, and uh, I'm super happy that we're going to be able to do this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Brooks Patton. I am a uh, I'm also a streamer, although I'm over living on Twitch uh, most of the time. I did spend like around three years uh, teaching with uh, CJ at Galvanize. And so we, uh, we basically have a lot of uh, similar styles because we work together so closely. Um, and then of course, we've now both gone on. We're both working full time as software developers. So it's, it's awesome to like have that teaching experience and then also be back into the industry as well. Um, a pretty rusty stream, yes, yes it is. So I have the I have um, a very similar setup to CJ. I have uh, my streaming computer over on a side here, over here, and I'm able to watch the uh, the um, the chat. Uh, CJ is online. He's uh, he's he's just watching the stream and also just uh, handling uh, handling chat as well. And uh, yes, as he said, I'm in my own home, so I am not physically with CJ, so we can't actually see him uh, walk in um, today. But uh, he'll be back next time he streams. Um, let's see. So let's, um, I, I do have this full checklist. I, I wanted to sort of uh, do the same style that, uh, that CJ uses for his, also because it's really nice and I kind of like this and I might, might adopt some of it myself. Um, all right, so uh, I can give a little bit more of a background of myself of why, why like how I got into programming. 
uh, because that's always been sort of like an interesting thing about where where we come from. Uh, I began uh, my my sort of computer career as a systems administrator working at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, specifically with the NASA Advanced Supercomputing uh, Facilities. And uh, that's where I really learned and started to program. And I began with, uh, with shell scripting and C. So uh, C is that like low level systems programming language that uh, everybody sort of like says you should learn in order to learn how the computer works. You have to implement garbage collection your own, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, but I never actually did anything. And that's kind of the reason why I ended up getting into Rust more recently. Uh, so let's talk about what Rust is and, uh, and why I am enjoying sort of programming with it and, uh, and doing that on the, on the, uh, like the background of my, uh, my day to day. So let's go over to, uh, the Rust, Rust uh, website here. Uh, to begin with, uh, unfortunately, uh, you have to use Rust Lang whenever doing any Google searches with Rust. I'll, I'll do some uh, today because uh, like CJ, I generally don't over prepare for my, uh, these type of lessons that I do. Instead, what I, what I end up doing is just uh, have a general, have a plan like, like we have. And uh, if I need to Google for it, we Google for it. Uh, we're getting noise. Um, was it any specific type of noise or the, I did hear there was somebody walking right above me. I'm in the basement, so that's uh, could have been that. Um, but if it's my mic peaking or something else, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll fix those uh, settings as well. Uh, okay, so um, Rust, they, they, they say that it has, it's the systems language, it runs really fast, it prevents th seg faults, but more interestingly, it guarantees thread safety. Um, you don't hear any noise? Okay, perfect. Um, oh, nice, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not cool in that way, so I don't get all of the, the new cool sl kid slang. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of tapping on my, I can turn that down just a little bit. That's. Let's try that. Okay. Um, when will I teach you Kotlin? Not today. I don't know Kotlin, and uh, currently I'm too having too much fun with Rust to to go into that that level of uh, uh, stuff. Um, so Rust. One of the more interesting things about Rust is that it doesn't have garbage collection. So um, I'm going to use sort of JavaScript as my uh, comparing language because uh, coding, you know, CJ and Coding Garden does a lot of JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript every, well, let's just say 300 milliseconds or so, it runs a garbage collector in which it just goes through and looks for all objects, variables, and everything else that no longer has a reference to something in, in code. And uh, if it finds one, it then deletes it from memory and frees that up for the rest of the operating system and obviously the rest of your code, which then speed things up which um uh so that is um that is it's nice in a way because you don't have to manually manage that memory but in some ways every 300 milliseconds or so like depending upon the implementation of javascript that actually can be really really bad because and this is something i saw at work recently we had giant json objects and when it went to clean them up it was taking many many thousands of milliseconds so several seconds just to clean those up and that was blocking the main so that's um that's that's the problem with with garbage collection and then of course we have languages like c and c plus plus where they make you do the garbage collection as the programmer you have to run commands to actually allocate and deallocate specific areas in memory well, this is great because you can control exactly when you're going to do that. And it's also not great because if you forget to do it or you don't do it properly, then you can have uh, at, well, if you do it wrong, at best, you can just have a, a memory leak or maybe a, a slower running application. And at worst, you have a security problem 
which uh, we've been hearing a lot about recently. And a lot of those are C++ written code bases in which they incorrectly implemented garbage collection or some kind of other thing. Um, let's see. Tony's in. Hey, Tony. And, uh, and then, yes, the other thing is, unfortunately, Rust uh, as a name shares, uh, shares its name with a very popular video game. It gets a little bit difficult to Google for problems, but uh, we'll, we'll see that later. Um, okay, what else? Oh, um, and just to finish up about garbage collection, Rust actually doesn't do either of those. Instead, it garbage collects right when it needs to, not before or after, and it, the compiler takes care of that for us. Uh, so we kind of get the best of both worlds here. And, uh, and then finally, the types of programs you can build with Rust, well, it's a systems language, and all that really means is that you could build software that other systems, that other pieces of software end up using. So think of like an operating system as a system you was created with a systems language. Um, a language, a compiler was created with a systems language. Um, and even like, you know, some something that like another, any other program, like a compiler, oh no, it's compiler a a driver or like a database connection systems link and of course you could build anything else i myself have built uh that starting soon screen that i had up previously that uh is running with a web server that is written in rust that's sending up a uh, back-end rendered uh back-end rendered files so you could do anything Rust is also used for WASM, or otherwise known as WebAssembly. That is uh, that is very true, Mario. Um, I strangely enough, I actually don't care that much about WebAssembly right now, but I think that's because it's so early in the stage. As soon as it goes into like a little bit later, I might be super into it. But uh, for me, I'm sort of using Rust to get away from web development because I do that all day for my day job. Uh, so Rust is my fun sort of get away from it all. Um, does that mean REST is a replacement for Java, which runs on billions of systems? Um, I think like replacement is, is a really strong word for a lot of languages. I mean, we could say that Node is a replacement for Python or Ruby, but uh, we all know that Python and Ruby aren't going anywhere. Uh, Node is just sort of fitting into the ecosystem along with it. So personally, I believe REST is gonna sit there with everything else, and it's just gonna be a new awesome tool. One really good, uh, cool thing that's being written with uh, Rust is uh, Firefox. So I'm using Firefox here, and um, the Mozilla team, who is behind Rust, they're the ones um, writing it. They are, um, they they are creating, uh, recreating Mozilla with Rust as they go through it. And uh, that new Quantum update, I think that was just them redoing the CSS engine and they got like a quarter time. Different tools for different jobs. Absolutely correct, uh, Josh. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about, if you wanted to get into Rust, uh, if you go to documentation off of the Rustlang webpage, and I don't think we, um, I was gonna copy and paste, but I can't do that from this computer to another computer. So it's uh, rustlang.org. So um, maybe maybe CJ can put that in there, or I'll put the we could put these links in the description after afterwards. But okay, so wrestling.org. If we come to documentation, uh, the best way to learn the language and the way that I used was the Rust uh, the Rust programming language, also known as the book. Uh, they do have the book for sale in a print edition, but you can get it for free right here. They have several different versions of it, along with new. Um, uh, each iteration that they go through, and uh, and that's that's fine. Let's go back and take a look at our checklist. I actually had all this planned out. Let's let's mark some of these off. Um, okay, installing Rust. All right, Rust. Installing Rust is actually really simply simple now because they have a shell script for us to use. Come to install Rust one three zero. 
we have this entire curl command. I did this a little bit earlier. I mean, I, did, I rebuilt my computer uh, recently, and I did do this to reinstall um, Rust on here, but this installs a program called Rust Up. And it's sort of like a NVM or any other version managing system for a, a programming language. In this case, Rust. Can you get it as an audiobook? Um, you know, in a way, yes, you can, Elka, uh, because I, um, on my channel, on Twitch, I went through the entire book and, uh, oh yeah, CJ got that. I, yeah, I went through the entire book. I read it all word for word until like chapter 17 or so, uh, which the, I started skipping things because they were redundant and, uh, and did every exercise. And so you have an audio slash video book. Um, Dan Jay, uh, you have a question. Why learn Rust? So for me, I like to learn Rust because it's a fun language to that's different than what I normally use, but then it also gets me practice with a systems level language. So working a lot lower than JavaScript or Python or something like that. And uh, the compiler and strong typing system really sort of gives, get, it reminds me of why I like those systems. And it also just gets out of the way. Um, knowing Alka will probably code a TensorFlow reader to make the audiobook, or he could do that. That that works too. Um, all right. So once we get, uh, once we install Rust up, we can in here just uh, a little bit bigger. Just do Rust up, and then once we have that. We can, for example, do Rust up show to show what versions of Rust and the compiler that we have installed. Uh, so I have install, uh, installed version 1.3.0 that came out just a few days ago. And every single time that Rust comes out with something, which is quite often, it's usually a very uh, a good for us because it adds new features. There is a nightly also that you can use with Rust up and uh, any other any other things. Um, awesome. Well, I'm hoping that, so my, my goal for today is to get you all interested in, uh, in Rust and sort of wanting to, to learn a little bit more about it. Personally, I also feel that learning Rust will make it so that when you take the knowledge and the, uh, the experience you gain from a, a compiler that's very strict, and then you bring that back to JavaScript, which just lets you do whatever you want. Uh, your JavaScript code will get better. That's that's my uh, that's my feeling. Oh, did I actually pronounce your name correctly? Awesome! That is that is actually something I never know if I'm doing it right or wrong because I rarely get feedback. So thank you. Uh, is the MDN course for JavaScript a good starting point? You know, I never took the MDN course for JavaScript, so I can't tell you that. I don't know. Maybe uh, if somebody else has in chat, they could uh, they can respond and say yes or yes. Right. Okay, with um, with Rust, we uh, we get we get a command line tool that makes it really easy for us to create new projects, and that is called Cargo. So I'm going to run this, but not in the to do CLI that I'm in. Uh, let's just um, I'm just going to cd into my desktop here. I'm gonna run cargo. And uh, Rust has decided to sort of go with the ocean faring cargo crate, that sort of theme here. So the command is cargo, and we're gonna do a new project, and we're just gonna say hello. It creates a binary application, hello project. If we uh, cd into hello, we'll see that it created for us a cargo.toml file. So they, they are not using JSON here. Toml is very similar to JSON. It in fact compiles down to JSON. We have a uh, .git. Uh, it automatically gives us a git ignore and a, uh, a source. Now I've already done this for my other project, which is why I just did that one in my desktop. So we can take a look here. I'm in VS Code and we can see all these files that it created for. So our Coggle Tomal actually gives us, uh, tells us, well, 
what, what we've got going on, who's authoring the name of the application and an auto versioning for us. And thank you, uh, I don't need, I don't need you this code. And we also have in source, where all of our source code is gonna go, we have a main.rs file and it gives us this, uh, a function main with uh, this one command inside of here. We get catch up with chat, make sure everything is. Um, Himan Shu, you're gonna be programming alongside. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I wasn't sure. Um, is anybody else uh, programming alongside? If so, then um, then I'll I'll definitely make sure to go nice and slow. And let me know if. Uh, well, regardless, this video is gonna be up up on here for uh, to catch up with, but. Um, if uh, if anybody gets lost, I do actually have on my Git. Of course, now Firefox decides to get nice and slow. Um, I do have on my Git a a repository that has a solution for what we're going to build up there already that I built like a long time ago on my stream. I don't actually know if we're going to end up with the same code because it has been over a month since I wrote that. Uh, so what was that? That was to do. July. And uh, if you go into the solution branch, it has all the code uh, that we're going to be building here. Awesome, James is gonna be building along as well. The uh, the probably the the biggest uh, hurdle to overcome is really just the download time and installing and making sure that that actually happens. Okay, so getting tons of alerts on my phone, but I think that's everybody in Discord chatting. Um, okay, you expect to hit a wall and I have to go back, which is fine though. Um, that is, so that's another thing I want to mention with Rust, we hit those a lot. The compiler is actually a very strict for us. That's part of that entire, uh, memory safety. It, it guarantees it by not allowing you to compile unless it likes you and likes what you're doing. Uh, thank you CJ for that link. So with that, back to our readme, oh, we created a brand new project. And uh, I just named mine uh, to do RS. We have to, in VS Code, open inside and have the cargo.toml as the sort of baseline file here. So uh, that's why I opened my VS Code a little bit ahead of time. And I went ahead already and I have um, Rust RLS installed. So this is gonna be extremely important if you're coding with Rust, is the Rust. RLS for Rust language support. Um, having this extension installed basically allows us to have uh, auto error catching in, inside of our code. Think of it like a linter. Now the problem with RLS is that it doesn't always install properly by itself. Now this one did for me uh, in my most recent reinstall of the operating system. Uh, but if it doesn't, I have in my so we have my to do cli in my github let's come to repositories and i have a learning rust and inside of here i have a wiki and here it goes in vs code and installing rls this tells us that sometimes if it if VS Code doesn't properly install all the things for us, the this rust up command, which is a rust up component add RLS preview, rust src, and rust analysis, uh, these things will then make RLS in VS Code work. Edgars, you're gonna code along too. Awesome. 
Uh, it now it should just work, but like I've I've seen it not work for mine in the past, and uh, other people have told me that it's not worked for theirs as. well. Thank you, CJ, for the link to uh, the wiki. Uh, what operating system I'm running, uh, Sultan? I am running uh, Ubuntu 18.10. Yes, that, uh, it is a flavor of Linux. Now, I can't help you if we're installing Rust on Windows because I've never actually done that myself. Uh, so that my guess is it's probably easiest to install it into the Ubuntu systems core. I think that's a thing in, in Windows now, in uh, Windows 10. Kotali, hey, you're going to code along as well. All right, so uh, here we go. We're gonna get our hello world up and running. Now, this is not that hard because when we do a create a cargo new, it actually gives us a hello world right here for us. Um, all right, so we have a, we have a function. So functions have fn instead of the word function. Every single language seems to like to do their function uh, definitions. Uh, the Windows Ubuntu subs, yes, that's the one to use. Um, and my, that's my guesser. Uh, fn for to create a function. Main is the name of a function that must be in all Rust uh, programs that are just main normal program. Um, like most good tutorials, there are minor little white lies that we might, we might tell, like you have to have a main.rs. There are programs which are libraries or, or other things that don't have those, but that is way beyond the scope of, uh, of today. That might be a future, uh, future video. Though. And uh, then it's just, just like a normal function after that. We have, uh, uh, bracket, uh, we have um, parentheses and curly brackets. And then we have a print line. So this is our essentially console log. But you'll notice that unlike a normal function, it has a bang. A uh, exclamation mark point between print line and the opening parentheses. This is it. There are a couple different types of functions in Rust, and the one that uses a print uh, exclamation point here is called a macro. And for today, we can just forget that they exist. We just have we just have to know that print line requires a bang, and then we just pass it whatever we want to be. Put into the uh, into the um, the command line. What to be printed out, and then a semicolon. Rust is a semicolon required language, although we'll see that there might be a line or two that we don't have to have semicolon on, and I'll explain when we get to those. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and open up our terminal here. Go off to the side. Am I? All right. I'm still a head is still above everything. That's good. And to run this, we're going to do cargo run. It's going to compile our code, which is not going to take very long because this is a very simple project. And uh, we'll just see what it did. It took 1.29 seconds. It's unoptimized, and then it ran it and we get our hello world out. So that is our hello world. Danny, Danny Fritz. Um, Danny is an awesome resource for, uh, uh, he's somebody that I use when asking about Rust questions as well. He's shown up on my stream a few times. So welcome, Danny. Also, I worked with him a little bit. All right, so we got our hello world. And then we get to start moving into the the more difficult the more difficult parts of actually building an app. We want to collect the CLI arguments into a vector. Well, let's. I want to talk to you about what how I expect to, to use this application. So I want to be able to say uh, cargo run 
and then have a command. So like, for example, get. And if I run cargo run get, I expect to get all of the to-do items listed back out in the If I want to add a to-do item, I would say add, and then in quotes, put in the item that I want to add, which may be something like do, do something awesome. Um, another one might be, well, okay, what if I want to do cargo run uh, mark complete? So maybe done, and then like three. The, I want to mark the third, the third item as complete. So that's how we, I, I want to have this uh, entire system work for us, but we're gonna to need to get these arguments and put them into variables for this to work. And uh, that means to begin with, we're gonna go straight to, uh, straight to Google and I'll show you how to do Google searches for Rust because it can be a little bit difficult sometimes. So to begin with, always start with Rust Lang when searching, because if you just search for Rust, you're gonna get the video game and not the language. And at that point, it's command line arguments. And uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of different places that we could go to get them, but I noticed that this first one is to the book. Let me go there. The book is a great resource, and because it's Mozilla backing this, they have really good SEO. So their searches come up early quite often. Hey, Robin. Um, okay, so in here, we're in the book second edition. I believe that like tw the 2018 version is going to come out soon and replace the second edition, but this is still a, a good one. To use. The rest game is super awesome, though. Um, I own the game, but I've I think I've played five minutes of it and I've really really played. It. Okay, so accepting command line arguments. If we search down reading the argument values, and here we here we go. We're going to grab them and stuff them into whatever, something called a vector. So I'm gonna explain all these things into it instead of like having to go through the entire book. Uh, but essentially we're gonna write this entire line out and figure out what the heck it is doing. So let's, let's begin here. We have let args. Well, so I'm gonna erase you. Start with let, I'm gonna call it arguments. So let is our variable declaration. Uh, instead of like a var or const, um, just let. That's that's all we really have. Uh, by default, every variable is immutable. So if I say let arguments equals five, and then I try to change arguments. So if I say arguments uh, equals maybe like a string of um, well, even if I say ten, I get this nice. Uh, ugly red under a uh, squiggle here and it's saying i'm trying to assign two arguments twice it's also telling me that we're never reading it uh, which is why it's sort of a weird green and red under because it's a warning and a full error so it's saying i cannot i cannot assign twice here so everything is a constant by default but i can change that by making this mutable now I, I am allowed to change it to it. Now I also said that everything's a typed, strongly typed system here. So it auto figured out what type this is and uh, we're just going fine with that. But if I change this to like a string, hello, it'll become upset at me once more. Oh, it's... um. He gets let mute. It'll become a set of me once more because now it's saying, well, hey, you uh, arguments initially was a integer type and now you're trying to put a string in it. That's not allowed. You can't do that. Do we care about white space? No, uh, Rust doesn't really care about white space, 
but uh, we're going to care about white space just because of uh, debugging is going to make it really easy. But yeah, Rust doesn't care at all. I think my lights just flickered. So stream, I think, is still good. But if uh, something, yeah, that was really weird. Uh, but everything, hopefully, is still good. All right, I think I think we're good with that. This is how we can we can create our variables. Let's let's go back to just let mute arguments and let's come back and take a look at what we have here. Now we have this entire colon vec string. Uh, let's not worry about this right this second. I uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to have I'll explain this once we get an error telling us why we have to do that. Why does Rust have semicolons? Or why just not have them? So it's a choice of the creator of the um, the language. So, um, oh, what what was his name? Just forgot his name. Uh, the guy who created uh, JavaScript decided to have automatic semicolon insertion. So it requires semicolons, but you Python just doesn't let you use them most of the time. And Rust decided you have to use them all the time except one or two tiny times. Uh, does Rust compare about indentation? No, it does not. I know, that was spooky. Types are coerced. Yes, they are. Uh, types are coerced except when it can't figure it out. So the compiler will attempt to figure it out, and then it will decide not, you know, then it will yell at you and like ask you to help it out if it can't figure it out. Brenda Neitch, right, that's it. Um, okay. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so Danny, Danny says the requirements for semicolons was to make it easier in a compiler parser. They talked about automatic semicolon insertion early on, but decided again. So uh, coming back to this line, the next thing we're going to do is this env args and then uh, do something with collect on it. Well, okay, env args. Um, we're going to be running a method a function args that's on the env standard library object. But here's the interesting thing. We're using this double double colons. Rust loves to use double colons. We'll see this uh, several times throughout our program. Uh, it's basically just going to reach in to an object that's been created for us and uh, use a method that's sitting on that. So env args. Let's uh, set that up here. env args like that. Now, here's the problem. env doesn't exist. So we're going to have to uh, pull that in. Why are you yelling at me? You're, oh, expected me to have a semicolon. So now it should yell at me and say it doesn't know where env is. Now, if I save this, I want to run this because sometimes uh, Rust gives you really awesome error messages. So if I do cargo run, fail to resolve, it tells us exactly where the problem is. Unfortunately, it doesn't, doesn't tell us where to find. Sometimes it can figure that out, but in this case, it doesn't look like it can. So I happen to know that env comes in the standard library. So I could just do std colon colon env colon colon args and this works however this is really 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 ugly and so we want to do the equivalent of like a, a node require or a uh, esx import so we can do that with use keyword to so use std colon colon env and then that allows us to skip this std here here's my delete key and now I can just do env colon colon arg. I could even go as far as to bring in args here and then just go straight to args. But in my, uh, in my opinion, it would make this a little bit uh, harder to read and remember that args comes from env. So I like to go this way, env args. Um, no, Daniel, I am not CJ. Uh, it's, a, it's a guest stream. I've taken over the channel. 
Um, I actually initially had a had joked with CJ about doing this on Halloween and uh, and just pretending to be CJ, but uh, we decided against that. Um, okay, so this isn't necessarily useful for us right now. Uh, if we go, args doesn't really give us what we want. Instead, we have to run this function called collect on it, and uh, we can do that dot collect. And there's several times where like a book or documentation will tell us you just have to do it. And uh, what I recommend as a challenge after this is completely done is go research what collect is and uh, why why args allows us to use it. Now, when we hit this. Uh, RLS is telling us that arguments, we need to give it a type annotation because it cannot infer the type. So the reason for that is in the args, well, we know that it gives us strings, but we are, we're humans. The compiler just reads through the code and, and doesn't make that inference. And so it's like, okay, you're going to take a bunch of uh, things and you're then going to collect them into a vector. And a vector is really just an array from JavaScript. That they're kind of equivalent. So we need to tell what it is. And this is where we're going to have to manually set the type for arguments. So we're going to use a colon. And the type is a vec with a capital V. And then we use um, something that the REST community calls the TurboFish syntax. And we're going to say that this is a bunch of strings. We're going to have a vector or an array of strings. Or a fake man bun. Oh, yeah. I never. So we did talk about me getting a like fake mustache with the little handlebars going out. But instead, I just grew out a real mustache. Uh, or no, a real entire beard. Um, that would have been that would have been awesome to get that and also like put my hair up in a, in a bun, but like I don't have enough hair to do that. But yeah, maybe maybe sometime in the future. Uh, okay, so now the only error that we're getting is a warning saying that we're not using arguments. It reminds you a lot of C sharp because it's a more it's a very recent language. I think it's five years old totally, and only a couple years since it went uh, 1.0. We can, uh, let's print this out and see what we got. So we're gonna do print line. Um, in print line, if we want to print things from a, uh, like a variable, we're gonna use these curly brackets inside of quotes, and then in the second and onward uh, arguments to pass in, we're gonna put in what we wanna see. But we get an error. It's telling us that we can't actually display uh, arguments, the vector, because it's saying that standard vec vec, standard string string, very wordy here, doesn't implement standard format display. So it doesn't know how to display to the screen. But it does give us some help. It says, hey, you could try uh, standard try uh, note in format strings you may be able to use colon question mark um, or colon pound question mark for pretty prints instead okay let's try that so this is something called debug printing mode we're going to do colon pound question mark and that will make the error go away everything should be fine now and let's uh let's try this again so cargo run and uh, we get a vector, and there's one item in it right now. There's always going to be one item when we use the env args collect, which is the location of the executable and where we called it from. Oh, Danny can't post about TurboFish because it thinks it's an HTML element. Uh, can I post the ID? I like the ID of, of this? 
like where this is coming from. I could put a biscuit on my head. Yeah, I, I guess I could. Uh, it's saying help use underscore argument instead. Yes. Um, underscore argument is a way for it to say, oh, this will never be used. So don't give me that art, uh, the warning. Uh, but if we, as soon as we use it, that goes away. And so we don't need, we don't need to worry about that anymore. Oh, of Danny's video. Um, Danny, if you've got a video, then, uh, then send it to, send it to CJ. Or if you're on the, uh, the discord, you can post it in think live there okay so we get arguments let's actually try this again but this time i'm going to give it actual command line arguments so for example let's say we want to run uh, cargo run add and we'll just say hello and we'll see that we get uh, target debug to do cli this is by the way the file of where it's compiling to this is the second uh, command line argument and finally the third one note that i put these in quotes because otherwise this would become uh the first second third and then fourth which uh would make it very difficult for us to figure out where where our to-do thing ends and i don't want to have to write logic for that so we're just going to make our users quote to do item um danny's now a mod awesome All right, so Danny can now uh, paste a turbo syntax, turbo fish syntax stuff in. Um, all right, so this actually just gives us these arguments. Now we can extract these out. So let's let's grab them. Let's uh, grab the command out of here. We're gonna do our command is gonna be equal to arguments, and we remember that the first one is just the location of where the program is. We want arguments of one. This is exactly the same as, uh, as arrays. We just want to give it the index of where it's going to be. Except now we're going to run into Rust being, well, it's very easy to think of it Rust being mean to us. Uh, but what it's telling us is we cannot, cannot move out of index content. This is the memory management uh, part of Rust telling us that we can't do this. Uh, we can't do this for memory safety. So the reason why, if we come back to here, uh, we can imagine Rust has in memory this, this vector, and it has three things in the vector. But if we say that I want this one and to extract it out of it and have it available in another variable, what happens if I delete, uh, if I try to like manage that and change it around in another variable? Well, it won't let us do that because that could be where uh, security vulnerability comes in or some kind of like memory leak or memory like invalid problem so instead it says well you have to move it out you have to like literally give ownership of this entire string to the other um, to the variable but um, our command doesn't do that by default just setting it equal to tries to move this out of here and the compiler is concerned about what will happen with the rest of this stuff. Won't let us do that. So let's just make it a, or we can copy it so we can clone this. So we can just do clone. If we do that, what ended up happening, and this is where I wish I had a whiteboard, uh, sort of like um, Daniel Schiffman with Coding Train. I would love to have a whiteboard that I can just walk over and start drawing on it. Uh, I don't have one of those. So uh, imagine here that what we have in memory is an array of like just uh, one thing. So string. And what we've done is we've now say, well, okay, we have a string, another. And down here, I just said, well, I want to store uh, another into memory somewhere else. It now exists here 
and a copy exists here. So it's been taken up, placed in two pieces of memory. It's inefficient, but it also just allows, uh, is no longer gonna be a potential security vulnerability. Just use a paint program. Um, I reinstalled, I don't actually know if I have a paint. Do I? No, I don't think I, I don't think I even have a paint program installed. That's how, uh, that's how empty this uh, computer is right now. Yeah, like a dropping a table. We don't want to do that if we're also accessing something in that table. So, um, that's what we're doing right here. It's, it's maybe like, it might cause some people to frown on us because we're not being as efficient as possible, but it allows us to do what we really want to. We've done a copy. We've done a deep copy. Uh, your touchscreen plus paint equivalent isn't enough. I think it is enough if I just had a paint equivalent application on here. Um, maybe if somebody could find one that runs in a website, I will load that up and, and try it out. Uh, but until then, let's continue on. So we've collected the CLI arguments into the vector. We need to store the user inputs. We've kind of done that. Uh, we're gonna begin with uh, list all tasks. What that might mean is if command is a get, we're gonna just print all the tasks. We don't need this print line anymore. Let's now switch to, uh, let's pretend it exists and what we would have to do. Well, we want to do a if, if, I keep on putting my mouse over the code, which is not the best, uh, the best place to put the If command is equal to string get. Well, it's not gonna be that quite this simple, but uh, first of all, notice that if does not use any uh, parentheses. We don't need those in Rust. There's minor little little differences here, uh, but th this is one of them. Uh, we do have curly brackets, so that's you know this is pretty standard for uh, C-based languages. And, uh, and then we're gonna say okay, if it's get, let's do a print line, and uh, we'll just say um, we got a get. Not gonna print any variables out. I accidentally brought that to the next. Let's save this. Let's see if this is what if this is what we get. I'm gonna do cargo run. And we got an index out of bounds. So it's very rare for us to get these type of problems in Rust, and this is one of the few ways that we can. It's because we're trying to get arguments of one. So the first position in this vector, it, but it doesn't exist. So if we're hardening this down to like supply to uh, the general public, we want to have to do some kind of if statement to make sure that the length of this uh, vector is long enough. Uh, let's not worry about that right now. And instead we're gonna just say, okay, cargo run get. Hey, and we got to get, if we do cargo run, add nothing at all just empty and that's how that's how we can test this later and like do what we really want to do with this code so instead of a print line we got to get we want to print out the entire list of items let's begin creating those it uh it's not going to end up being super straightforward because well we want a to do like a to do list so to do list uh, by default, uh, Rust uses snake case instead of, uh, and in fact, RLS will yell at you if you try to use uh, Pascal or um, camel case or any of the other cases. So let's do list equals, that's gonna be a vector. We can't really do this. We have to tell it it's gonna be a vector, but then it's like, how do we put the two items in it? We need an object. We need to create the actual to-do item first. And we can't just create objects on their own. 
we're gonna have to do essentially the uh, uh, a function, a, a structure that creates objects for us. We have to define a new type. And we do that with a struct keyword. Struct, the name of the structure, which we use capital uh, Pascal case for this. I'm gonna call this to-do item. And then uh, let's give this uh, what properties it needs. We need a name. This is gonna be a string. And we need a completed. And uh, I was initially thinking of doing this as a Boolean, true or false, but I have an idea that uh, we can just print out like an X if it's completed or a space if it's not. Let's actually make this a single character. So we need quotes there. All right. RLS isn't the fastest in the world. So sometimes it, uh, it sticks around and you have to wait for a couple seconds before it recompiles and uh, checks to see how everything is. Uh, how are we doing with chat? Is it one indexed? It's actually zero indexed, but the first item in the vector is the location of the binary. Does Rust have a switch statement? In a manner of speaking, it does, but it's not called a switch. I'll be going over that in a little bit. Um, also, Danny is mentioning it depends upon if it's a string or an str. Uh, we'll be going over that a little bit, but it is one of the things that sort of drove me crazy when I first started learning in Rust is that there are two types of strings. How is Rust used to develop Firefox Quantum if there is no camel case? Um, well, it's sort of the behind the scenes. It's compiling uh, like the CSS rendering system uh, right now, and I think there's more things that are being compiled too, but uh, it's really just its choice. Uh, now you can write it in the camel case or other thing, but it uh, it will yell at you and tell you that you shouldn't do that. String is capitalized while care is not. I know that's, this is another one of those things that drives me a little bit crazy about Rust is that the type string is a capital S and the type care is a lowercase c. Now the other thing is notice how my, my mouse, it isn't bringing up information about care, but it does about string. They're completely different types, but we can sort of use them as the, like, all I can say is it's a little bit weird. And Danny might be able to talk a little bit more about like the true differences of it. But basically care is a, uh, is a full, what what is it? The um, it's full base type, whereas a string with a capital S is a special sort of a higher level. Type. What I really like is that when RLS is nice and gives you this, it actually gives you a link to the documentation for strings. Yeah, like in Java. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we have this structure, and to instantiate. A new uh, a new object from this to do item. But I don't think Rust actually calls them objects. Uh, we'll just say okay, let uh, to do item equals. Uh, we'll call it do item. There's no new keyword in Rust, so we don't have to worry about that. Instead, we just do to do item. We have the curly brackets because it's a curly bracket uh, structure, and then we'll just do its name. And uh, well, it's the, uh, what, what's the name of our to-do item here? Uh, we'll give it a, um, say hi to CJ. And uh, completed, we'll give it a space, a single character. Now notice that I need double quotes here. Uh, these are for strings, and uh, single quotes are for characters only. Cannot use this. That's also like Java. And then I'll put a semicolon here. Now, it's going to yell at me saying, "Hey, invalid type. A just double quotes in their own are something called a static string or static str." I've been 
talking with the rest of the rest community we're calling these stirs so the differentiate so these are stirs and these strings so i need to change it into a string well i can just run a two string function on it and that will convert it from one to the other Yeah, I've heard a lot of people saying that it looks a lot like Golang. I've not used Golang, so I can't I can't say exactly um uh exactly how close close to that it is. So now we have a to-do item. We need to uh we need to put this inside of uh, a vector of of things. I can create a vector, so we can do let um to do list equals there's a shorthand. Um, there's a shorthand macro that allows us to create vectors really easily, and that's vec with a, ca a lowercase v and an exclamation point. And then we can just use square brackets and then put our to-do item inside of that. And uh, that gives us a vector. And now we can, uh, we can print that out. We need to, if command equals get, we're gonna to need to loop through this and then print these out one by one. Well, there's a, it's really actually pretty easy to do for loops in Rust for this. You just type four. Uh, it's very similar to Python for loops. Uh, we don't need curly brackets and we don't, uh, sorry, we don't need parentheses with like let i equals zero and then go through the length. We're just gonna say like for uh, item in uh, the to-do list and now we're going to have access to the item so we're going to want to print and uh, here's what i'm thinking we're going to print the the completed status so i'm going to have something like square brackets and which means now i need curly brackets inside of there to inject whatever is the completed status is i'm going to have a dash and then the name. So in here, we're gonna put in the first one. That's going to be the item dot completed. Second is gonna be item dot name. And uh, I'm not seeing any errors pop up here. Let's, uh, let's give this a try. We're gonna do uh, cargo run get. And uh, we get say hi to CJ as our first item on team. All right, put the code back up so that everybody who's following along can, uh, can look at that. I'm gonna look at chat again. Uh, and Java string S is capitalized because string is a class. So there's no classes in Rust, but it's kind of the same idea. The capital S in string is a um, is a structure, just like right here. Why does this exist? Why does Rust exist, or why does like some of these other things in Rust exist? Um, it it does look a little bit weird. Oh, and Felix, you're here. Awesome. It's been a while since I've uh, seen you on uh, on stream. All right, and I'm caught up with chat. Looks like uh, Jan Danny is dropping some um, dropping some good knowledge on that. Let's take a look at how we've gotten here. So we've we created an empty list, we seeded it with some default data, and we list all the tasks. Now, I do have the next thing as to add a new task, but before I do that, I want to uh, I want to maybe talk about, I'm gonna move this to the left because I think uh, it's, yeah, my name's starting again, my head's starting again in front of it. I want to refactor this a little bit because we have a lot of stuff going on in the main function here 
And that's going to make it a little bit tough for us to start, you know, add things in there. And there, there's some niceties that Rust gives us that's going to make it really easy for us to uh, add things in if we take some time to refactor right. And the idea is that we're going to use the compiler to let us know whether or not we're uh, we're doing a good job or if we need. So to begin with, I don't really like this idea right here. This is kind of well, it's kind of just a messy. What if I wanted to seed multiple items? I'm going to have to do this like three or four times. Let's actually implement a function on this structure that lets us do that ourselves. The struct to do item. And we can do that with the implement. Implement new item. And now I can create a function called new. So there is no new keyword in Rust, but we can use new ourselves. So new, and we're going to take in a name. And in functions, we have to give the, uh, the type manually ourselves. And that's how the auto type system uh, works in Rust, is because they're implemented in the function. So we happen to know that these are all going to be strings. We're going to take in a string. And uh, we don't need to take in a completed status. Everything starts in an uncompleted state. And we're going to return. So this uh, skinny arrow is uh, letting us say what the return type is going to be. And it's going to be the to-do item type. Um, am I cutting out? Cutting out uh, for the for you, finish shoulder. I do want it for a split second, but everything is good now. Yeah, I'm hoping it's not like that weird thing that we had uh, earlier with the lights. Um, but hey, if some if like the electricity goes out suddenly, then I'll just have to go to my phone and uh, let you all know on Discord. Um, okay, so since everything is good again, this is going to be the return type for this function. So we're going to take in the name, and uh, then all we have to do is return, return, do item, and it's going to be the exact same thing here. We want return the name, and I could do name colon name, and uh, completed is going to be the single character space. And with that, all it's complaining about is that we're not using it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and use this now. So instead of to do item equals this entire thing, we're just going to change this to to do item is the string that. And that cleans up our code uh, pretty well. In fact, I can now say this is to do item one and create another one here. Let do item two equals, uh, let's do, um, do something. To string. And now we have two to do items. So we'll be able to add those in once we, once we get to that part. Uh, then we have our, well, now, now we're going to have, now we have this problem. So the compiler is yelling at us now because it cannot find value to do item in this scope. Well, that's because I changed it. This is the one of the nice things with, um, with Rust. Well, I guess this would happen in, um, in JavaScript too. But the compiler is really good at yelling at us about certain things. Uh, let's see. So item.completed, no field completed on type, third string string item on to-do list, getting to-do item one in here. Item.name, we should still get that, shouldn't we? Uh, let's see what we're, let's see what's going on. Uh, Adam asks, why are we using a two string next to a string? The reason is because Rust actually has two types of strings. So this is a stir or an str uh, and it's basically sitting in one type of memory, and strings with a capital S, which is this type of string, is sits in a different type of memory, and we're converting from one to the other. 
it's actually one of the parts of uh, Rust that sort of drove me crazy when I first started learning it and probably will drive everybody crazy. You're right, we have to call the new function. Uh, because we can't just say to do item equals this, that doesn't make sense. So we have to, you're right, uh, we have to do to do item colon colon new and then we'll pass in the say hi to CJ string. We have to do this exact same thing, this one. Since that gives us a two to item one, two to item two, we're getting a warning that we're not using this second one. So let's go ahead and add this here to item two. And now everything should just work. It should just be fine. So let's go ahead and run this, see, see how it works. So we're gonna cargo run get, and we get say hi to CJ and do something with rest. Now, there's some more refactoring they would like to do here that will make our life a little bit easier in the future. Uh, to begin with, this is kind of, if we see, like, what if we want to see with 10 things? This is kind of nasty. Uh, so I want to move this, the to-do list itself, into another structure. Uh, Nino asks, is Rust as fast as C++? And I think the answer is it depends. If you write Rust correctly, then yes, it can be as fast as C++. Um, and in some cases it might be faster, in some cases it might be slower. I think it's just like is C++ faster than C or any other you know, fast running language. Uh, there's a lot of it depends. What did the implement do? Uh, this told us, uh, told Rust that we want to have this function new uh, assigned to this structure that we can go, okay, to do item, colon, colon, new. And then it would, it would just sort of work with us. That's kind of what we're going here. Um, is implement to do item like a class? I guess like we could sort of see it like a blueprint. Yeah, we're, we're designing like, okay, this is a structure and it's gonna be creating objects for us. And uh, this is the blueprint of what it's going to look like, the shape of it. Um, there's a lot of things in classes, like in Java, that are not implemented. So they're not quite as, it actually, this reminds me a lot more of prototypes with JavaScript than it does classes in Java. And CJ just pointed out there a Rust by example, which is a super, super good resource because it lets you see all of these things being written out. Let's now implement this, uh, this list in a structure here. So we're gonna kind of copy this. We're gonna say, okay, uh, struct. Uh, we're gonna call this a to-do list. And uh, we just want the list. And instead of like a string or anything else, we want this to be a vector, so it's gonna be a vector of to do items. I'm gonna use this structure in this structure. And then there's really nothing else that we need in here. It's just a, a structure of one property, one value. But we're gonna have an implement for it. First, that allows us to create a new function just like what we had previously. So in this case, uh, we don't need to take anything in. We're just gonna be able to initialize a brand new empty list. And so we're gonna return a new to-do list. And so in here, just gonna put return uh, to-do list. Uh, open bracket like this. Well, here's, and then uh, I, mean, I guess we have to have list, uh, and that's, you can just give it like an empty vector. Uh, there's really not much we can do in, inside of this. I think we can do, 
a vec bang. Can't do that. Or there is a way for us to do vec bang bang, or no, colon colon do, and say, okay, well, we've got a brand new vector. And because we told it what type of vector is going to hold, it's perfectly fine for us to do this here. And semicolon. This will now allow us to, uh, to implement this to-do list here. So instead of this vector with to-do items here, just say to-do list equals to-do list, colon, colon. And now we have a new to -do, empty to-do list in to-do list. Audio cuts out slightly. Do you have noise gate and OBS? I do have a noise, noise gate. Uh, is it cutting out the end or the beginning? Like it's off right now, but it, it might be uh it might be something else going on. Or maybe I'm turn it back up a little bit. If it uh, if it keeps on happening, let me know and I'll I'll play around with the noise gate. Uh PP Voltal, you don't like the imp do the new implement on the struct since it looks like it creates a to-do instance. To create a to-do instance. Beginning when my when oh okay yes I do have that. Uh, what I can do is come into my mic to filters noise gates and open threshold. Now okay, you turn it off. I could just turn off the noise gate off. All right, uh, hopefully that should be a little bit better. All right, so let's try this again. Let's uh, continue on. Uh, I like the idea of the new on it um, because I can just pass in things to it and then I get it back and I can set these defaults like we have here and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Now we wanted to implement an add task. So let's... Uh, Let's do that so we can add these items when we when we um, uh, seed the list, which is going to obviously happen after we instantiate a new to-do list. But in order to do that, we need to be able to have some kind of add function inside of to-do list here. So let's come in here. In to-do list, so not the items, but in the list, because the list needs to be able to add to this uh, vector, we're going to have a function add add to list and now here's where it's going to give it a little bit different because we're not going to call this with the colon colon now we're going to call it with dot and the reason we're going to call it dot is because we want the context of uh of what it is now that may sound a little bit weird in javascript parlance we want this we want the this value of course it's not called this in rust itself so we're going to get a, we want to also change it. So we're going to need a mutable reference. So a reference, because I don't want to actually like destroy it and create a new one to self. And we want the actual item to add. So I think that was just the, uh, the name, which is a string. And we're not going to return anything at all, so we don't need to worry about the uh, uh, the colon here. So I think it's on the other side. So mutable reference to self. Now, if we don't know that we need that, let's just start with putting self in, because we see this in the documentation all the time that we need uh, a reference to self. And if I say, okay, we're going to do self dot list dot push. Uh, in vectors, we have the idea of push just like arrays in JavaScript. And we're going to want to push the value in, which is going to be a new to do item. So now we can say, okay, this is to do. Uh, it's not. The only problem here is that it's not letting me autocomplete inside of here because 
uh, VS Code is is not super happy about this, so let's uh, let's actually create a a variable for it. So to do item is going to be equal to to do item colon colon new, and we're going to pass it the name. That'll give us the two item, and now we can push to do item in here. Now this this works, but by taking this in, let's see if we run into any problems. We have red squigglies down here. It uh, it's saying that we no longer have access to 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 do list is not an iterator. Oh we, well, yeah, because we lost to do list. It's no longer what we expect it to be because this is now a structure. So we can do to list dot list. And that lets us come through here. Now we're just running through and we're getting a whole bunch of these errors. It's not a problem. We're not supposed to be upset about this. We're supposed to be happy that Rust is catching these bugs before it allows us to compile. So it's telling us we cannot borrow self.list of the immutable binding as mutable. So first of all, it's saying we're just trying to take self and own it and like take ownership, but it's telling we're not allowed to do that. We need to make it mutable. So that's where we have to add the mute keyword in here. So if we do that, if we make it mutable, then everything seems to work and it's happy. Uh, if we want to be even more safer, we can make this a reference to self so that we don't clone it and copy it, but instead we're just getting a reference to its point in memory. In Golang and C++, use a factory function. Yeah, you could use factory func you can create factory functions in Rust too. Um, Rishab, uh, what is Rust? Rust is a, a systems programming language. I'm sort of going through the basics of it right now. Um, and as Daddy says, you can use it for programming language, making programs that other languages like use or other programs use, or just anything at all. Does have Rust have generics? Yes, it does. Although we won't be going over that today. Uh, but yes, absolutely, it does have generics. And uh, why learn Rust? Uh, I like to I like to use Rust because it's a it's a nice change of pace from web development to go into more of a systems programming language to learn the um, uh, the memory management side of things and uh, improve my programming all around. Uh, okay, so now we only have green, which is the warnings that we're not using these things. So let's go ahead and make sure that we start using it. So we have add to list. So we have these to-do items here. Let's go ahead and add them in. So we're going to say to-do list dot add to list, and it's going to be uh, to-do item one. And let's go ahead and copy this, duplicate this line, and we'll do to do item two. And you're yelling at me, so it expected a struct, standard string string, uh, found to do item. So it's actually telling us we no longer need these, uh, these entire structs that we're doing. So this allows us to clean this up a little bit. So we can say, say hi, hi to CJ becomes straight into here and uh, do something with Rust, go straight into here, and these two lines get to go away. So now things are a little bit simpler. And uh, now we're getting the error, cannot borrow immutable local variable to-do list. So because this is changing the structure and how it works, uh, it's saying that we, we've got an immutable, uh, we got an immutable copy of that in memory. So we'll just tell it that we want a mutable version of it. And then it works. Imagine that this was like in JavaScript, if you take out an object, even though it's in a const, you're still allowed to play around with the object, change properties on it, 
add properties, remove properties. Imagine if you needed to also say, no, 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 not like make it really uh, immutable. Like do not allow anything to change on that. And that's default in Rust. Does it have lambdas? Oh, it does have lambdas. Yes, it does have lambdas. Although they're called something else. They're called closures in Rust. I don't think we'll be using them in this, uh, this tutorial here. Uh, okay, so then finally, this is uh, getting a lot not nice and clearer. Uh, let's, change, let's put this entire for loop inside of our to-do list. So we'll call this function, we'll just make this a print. And this will also take, uh, we don't need to mutate it. So let's take a reference to self and nothing else. We're not gonna return anything. And all we're going to do is just put this for loop inside of it. So for item, and instead of to-do list, it's gonna be self.list, and then everything else is going to be the same. Uh, cannot move out of borrowed content. So we need to also reference the list with an uh, ampersand here. Then down in this uh, command get, instead of this for loop, we can now put our to-do list dot print. And that will, allow, that will print what we want. Now, this might be a little bit confused. Let's, uh, let's actually check it. Like we've done a lot of code. We haven't run it yet. Uh, we wanna see if we run our get, does everything still work? And yeah, everything still works. So we just did a bunch of work to refactor things, but the compiler says it's all good, so therefore we're all good now. Um, do I like the syntax? Yes, I actually do like the syntax, uh, especially because it's different enough than, uh, than uh, JavaScript that I don't get them confused together. Uh, sometimes I do forget the semicolons, which reminds me, notice that in this print, we didn't, uh, well, there is a semicolon right here, but um, we don't have a return, everything is just fine. So I wanna show you, we don't really need a semicolon on here because Rust, Rust has two ways to return things from functions. First of all is with this return here, or I could emit the semicolon, and if I do that, emit the return. This only works if it's the last running line in the function. It will return whatever, it, whatever that is. So I'm gonna do that to both of these. Now clearly you can choose to do the return keyword or not. Uh, I actually kind of like this. I, I've gotten used to not using the return keyword on these functions, uh, but I, it does take a little bit of getting used to and it might cause, uh, might cause you to sort of like have this like, no, that's wrong. You should always have a return keyword. Um, but that's one of the big sort of changes from other languages. All right, so that was all after we did the list all uh, tasks. We use the double colon for calling functions when something is returned and dot when we don't return anything. No, not, not exactly. It's, it's a little bit different. We use double colons when we don't want to have access to self. So when we put when we use dot when calling these functions, it gives us access to self. When we use double colon, it does not. So we don't need it for new, and we do need it for add to list and print. And uh, that's the biggest sort of reason for it. Okay, so we want to add in here. So now we're gonna have we're gonna have our command. It's going to now be an add. So we'll have an else if command is equal to add. If the command is an add, then uh, we're gonna want to get the next, the like what it is that we want to add. 
Well, okay, so that's just going to be a string, right? So we're going to clone arguments of two. So let, uh, I guess this is going to be like the name of what to be done, or maybe I'll call this the task, is equal to arguments of position two dot clone. And once we have this, we already have everything in place to add it to the list. So let's uh, let's just do that. To do list dot add to list, and uh, we're just going to add it to task. And uh, just to make sure this is working, because we're only storing this in memory, as soon as the as soon as the program ends and exits, it's all gone. We're going to uh, to do list. Dot print. And this is the reason why I wanted to put that in to do list, because we're going to print a lot. So we saved that. We, uh, we have our get still, and it's just going to be those first two items. But now we can say add and um, maybe say, or just uh, hello. And hello has been added to the end for us. So we, we see like we're immediately getting access to some, making it really easy to add new functionality. For example, this add to task. Now, we do want to refactor this a little bit. Uh, I can't remember who, but somebody mentioned does Rust have a switch statement? Because we're going to get, we're going to start wanting to deal with that kind of right now. Uh, and the answer is no and yes. It doesn't have switch, but it has something called match. So we're going to match when the on command. We don't need this equals equals here. So we're going to match command, and we're going to say okay in here. If it's a get, and here's where it gets a little bit odd. Instead of the skinny arrow to like do something, it's the fat arrow. And it's not a function like in JavaScript. It's just saying, hey, if it's a get, run this code. And there's no semicolons at the end. This is going to be comma based. OK, so if it's command, if it's a get, we do this. There's no else if. So now if it's an add. And we can have these curly brackets to run groupings of code. So there's that, and we'll tab you in. Now the problem is we have mismatch types because expected structure standard string string found a reference, uh, and it doesn't really give us a uh, a help here. But uh, basically, when we hard code a string in, it's a reference, unfortunately. It's not a full string. So we can either put these in as like full strings, or we can do, we could do something else. And here's where uh, we can just uh, create a data structure called an enum that allows us to store the types of what this is. We can set it up here, and then we can check it down here. So we're just going to want get and add to begin with. So to do this, it's just enum, and uh, and then we'll just call this a command. And our first one is going to be get. So we'll call this. Um, can I remember if it's get? Let's let's actually go and take a look at the Rust by Example book for this. So we're going to look for Rust by example enum. Lots of different languages have this idea of enums. JavaScript doesn't. So this might be a little bit uh, sort of different than you're used to. Uh, but the idea is that we're able to just create a new type that stores not necessarily full data, but um, uh, just little snippets of information. For example, we have this enum web event, and it can just be a thing, um, or it can be a, th uh, a character or a string. So we kind of want a thing that would be get or um, maybe a string for add. And then to, to use it, so we see web event here. 
but we don't see it being created here. Do we have web event? These are being sort of set to these things. So let's let's uh let's give this a try here. And uh, what is it? It's um it's just the thing that we want to create with a comma next to it. So we can say that this is get comma or add, and it's going to be a string. So the enum is uh, enumerator is going to be a type command. It's only going to be one of these at any one time. It's not a data structure that holds all of these. It's just going to be one of these at any one time. Uh, so that allows us to say like, hey, if it's only get, it cannot be an add. So we don't have to worry about anything else. All right, so to create this, we get the command in here and we're gonna have to like set that up. So at this point, we might want to match off of this and uh, and sort of like figure, figure that out. So let's move this down one line, give it a little bit of space, and we're going to match. And I'm going to do command and lowercase because it's going to be an instance of this enum. So it's going to be match, uh, it's actually going to be let command equals match arguments. And uh, if we don't clone this, it's just gonna be a reference to it. Unfortunately, I think we have to do a to ref. Is that? It'll tell me if it can find it or not. Oh, and I need a semicolon for this too. Will it find it? No method to ref. Okay, so it's not it's not to reference. Uh, it might be, oh, it's I think it's to stir. No method. Oh, and look at this. Help. Did you mean as stir? Okay, that's what I wanted. Not to, as. And this is one thing I really like about Rust is that it does, if it can figure it out, it helps you a lot. And so now it's complaining that my match, uh, which is the equivalent of a, um, oh, a switch statement, is not covering every potential possible thing here. So, uh, well, if this is if this is a get, it's the exact same element here. Whatever we want returned into this command, so this would be a command get. That's what we're going to return. Um, otherwise, we would return. Okay, if it's an add. We want to return command add, and then in the parentheses here, we want to put in the actual string. So that would be the arguments of two dot two string. Actually, it was clone. And so now we have this enum, this command that has this get and add. And so now instead of matching off of this, uh, the strings get and add, we can match, uh, is it just get? Or is it just add? Um, now, of course, up here, it's saying, what if there's more stuff? Arguments could have more things. You need to be able to catch them all. So Rust does have a catch-all. It's an underscore. And uh, I can basically say that I don't really care about this. Um, and I can't remember. I think it's just, uh, well, actually, you know what? If it's nothing at all, like, so if it's not get or add, then we want it to we want it to like exit out right away. So that's full out panic. 
So it's a panic macro, so it has that exclamation point, and we give it a message saying, you must uh, provide a, um, a proper, like a pride and accepted command. And now it's gonna be happy because, hey, if it's get or add, that's okay. If it's anything else, exit out of the program. And Rust is happy with that. They will not have any security holes with that. Now, pattern binding get is named instead of one of the one of the types. So it's actually suggesting, well, you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that. What if it's command get? And this is command add. But I need to have access to the actual um, string that I wanted to get because this is this is here. So we're gonna put name in here. Actually we call it task. We'll call it task. And now we have access to task which was stored in the enum is then going to be added to the task. This was a this might have been a little bit of crazy here. But uh, the, the really cool thing about enums is that it allows you to uh, condense com uh, more like complex things that would have to be stored in separate variables or maybe a full structure. But if they're simple, then you store them in enums and then just like just check to see which one you have. Uh, are there any GUI frameworks for Rust? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, there's even game engines for Rust. Like, for example, GGEZ um, is a game engine for Rust. Amethyst is also another one. Does match have a default like in JS? That would be this, uh, this underscore is like default. Why not just use get if there are no args as the shortcut? Uh, I kind of am. Um, I'm just saying like this get in, in the, the command is the one that I'm going for. Also, notice this. It's saying, it's yelling at me saying, hey, get should be capitalized. Uh, also, this is something that I personally am not necessarily thrilled with. They call this camel case and I call it Pascal case. So they want this to be get with capital G and this to be an add with capital A. If we do that, everything will break down here. So we'll have to change these to get with capital G, add with capital A. But luckily it tells us exactly where the problems are. And no more warnings. Everything should still work exactly the way we want it to, and uh, we should be able to run our code. So git run add hello, and we're able to add hello. Uh, okay, so that, that lets us add a new task. We wanna mark a task as complete. Um, the next question I had, because it is coming up on three, I don't know how long um, CJ wanted me to do. I could definitely continue on, or I could uh, uh, break and we could do another uh, like another stream some other time. Um, so I'll let, I'll let CJ decide. Uh, but until then, I'm just gonna keep on moving on. For marking a task as complete, I'm gonna want to use that as uh, cargo run and then sort of like done and then like two to mark the the um one of these done in order to do that i need to have like an the index of it well it's just a uh it's just an array it's just a vector so if i can when i print these out get access to which one it is that would be perfect so of course i could start with zero based and like do that itself, but there is a way to do that. So let's let's go and like find um, how I can get access to that. And I think it, that's not the search I wanted. I want Rust Lang, so it's going to be for loop v 
vector, uh, index, and value. I want to get all of those at the same time. And well, there's this one, explicit use of index and for loop instead of iter.enumerate. Um, I don't know if I want, like, I, this sounds like it might be right. Uh, number of iterations, I'm not sure that's what I want. I want, like, the actual thing it is. If CJ is not there, maybe maybe I'm just going to stream forever more and just take over the channel forever. Um, although I have to go to bed sometime and go eat dinner and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I'm seeing this enumerate come up a bunch. So let's, let's actually tell, take a look and see what, what that is. So let's, let's add that into the search here. It enumerate. So there's this loops, Rust programming language. There's iterators, enumerators, for and range. Here it is, how to iterate a vector with indexed position. So let's, let's try that. In a similar project, you just printed that, I just printed the command isn't handled and wait for a new command. So that's, um, I'm sort of exiting out in between each one because it's not, it's not the best way to handle it, but yeah, if you're doing a, an infinite loop around and just waiting for it again, that would be the way to handle it. Uh, okay, so if I want, here we go, take a look at this. You can use the enumerate function for position and element in v.iter.enumerate. So the question is, can I just use enumerate off of the, uh, off of the vector or not to. Let's go take a look at, oh, it doesn't doesn't have the documentation in enumerate. Let's go to the full Rustlane documentation and look for enumerate. Um, documentation in Rust is both good and bad. Uh, some of the documentation has the uh, has like the source code. That's the one we just saw temporarily, and then I just went to another one, and this one has better uh, better information about it. So if we have what well, looks, this is an array. Uh, this is an array in in Rust, not to be confused with vector. Uh, it's a little bit more strict than vectors, let's say. Uh, so we want to probably iter off of the vector and then enumerate. But uh, what we could try is just, okay, for item in self.list, what if I just try dot enumerate? So it doesn't, there was no autocomplete there, so it may or may not work. No method name enumerate off of it. Um, the method enumerate exists, but it's not available here. So it looks like we do, are gonna have to have this dot iter in between. And so now it's saying, well, that's lovely that it was not able to show me everything. Okay, now it's saying the trait bound uh, enumerate iter is not satisfied. Maybe try it. Maybe try calling dot iter or a similar method. Well, I am calling dot iter. Um, actually, you know what? I may not. I may have to just use self the list. Ah, that's what it was. So I no longer need to use the reference to self, and uh, now I can just go straight off of it. So the way I, I figured that out was with the error. It said, "Hey." Uh, it's not implemented for this reference, the standard iter enumerate. Could help consider removing one leading ampersand. So I removed it and it's fine. Now the key is here that it's gonna return uh, two things. Uh, these are called tuples. And I'm gonna call this, um, okay, the first one is going to be the index and the second one is going to be the item. 
And so I'm going to add in the uh, before the completed. Let's put in the um, the index. So right here, index. So let's do our get and see if this uh, this works for us. So uh, cargo run get. There we go. Zero and one. So we want to mark this task as complete. To me, we're just going to pass in uh, the command done and then the index of where we want to do this. So uh, where are we putting that? Well, in our command, so we're going to want a done. So a done. And we're going to have to give this a, uh, a type, like a, a number type. Numbers have types. They're not just numbers in Java, like in JavaScript. And there's lots of types of numbers. Uh, let's see what happens if I just choose a very generic one. We can use I32 uh, or U32 or any other number ones. If you've ever heard about I or U, like they stand for assigned or unsigned. Um, I guess they didn't want this to be S32. This is an integer for like an integer 32. Um, signed or unsigned really just means does it have, does, is it able to have the negative? Can it go into negative? Uh, this never can, it starts with zero. So we can just use an unsigned 32 bit number. We can go as far down as U8, uh, but we have no idea how many, how big uh, this array, this vector can get. So let's just do the very basic. If you just start with U32s, you'll be fine. Um, and then later on, you can you can sort of experiment with other number types. So we have done here. And now command is telling us, hey, we're not covering uh, what could be added in here. Well, before we do that, because this is being covered by the underscore, let's add in uh, done. And we want to return a command, colon, colon, done. And uh, this is going to be the whatever is passed in. So it's going to be arguments of two. And we need to convert this. Let's just convert this to as a U32. See if we're allowed to do that. Non-primitive cast. Standard string string as u32. We're not allowed to do that. Um, does it have any help here? Uh, it can only be used from primitive traits. Uh, consider using the from trait. So can we use, uh, so we have arguments to, can we say u32 colon colon, from, will this work? I always forget how to, uh, okay, so it's not satisfied, it's the trait, oh, so so from is, is here, but it just doesn't allow us to do it for U32s. Uh, we can come, let's see, Boolean care, so we can do all sorts of things except for strings with a capital S. So not, just unfortunately doesn't work for us. Um, and Danny was just suggesting the U32 from, so that this, this unfortunately doesn't work for us. There is an actually parse. So let's go back to Google and let's try uh, parse um, number rest lang. Convert a string to int in rest. And it looks like str parse. So you have my string to a string with a capital S, and then you can do my string dot parse and tell it what with the turbofish syntax. Uh, so that's we're gonna have to do that. So I'll have to parse it. This is sort of like parse int. So we're gonna have arguments to dot parse, was it dot or colon colon? It's dot parse. 
and and that that should be just it. Let's see what it says. Mismatch types expect to do 32. Found enum standard result result. So notice that in this here it says that we should use an unwrap on this. We didn't put an unwrap and now it's telling us that we've got this special result thing. Unwrap allows us to say, hey, if there's an error, so if you cannot parse into a number, which is possible, then uh, go ahead and, uh, and just crash the system down and print whatever the error was going, being handed back to us and, um, and uh, print that to the screen. We could also use something called expect, which allow us to overwrite the message. Uh, in fact, I could do that right now and just say expect, and we'll just say error converting to int integer. I'm gonna wrap this, and there we go. Now we have done. Now we have the done command. That's come down to the bottom. It will have match command. We now have to handle command done and this is going to be the index and uh, we have a we have a couple choices here uh, rust have classes and inheritance not exactly they don't have classes at, or inheritance but you can they have these traits and you can kind of create that entire system with traits if you wanted to but uh, you have to sort of manually implement um, okay, so what if we just created a, a done thing in the list? So if we told the list, so to-do list, and we just told it that we want to mark as done, so mark done, and we passed it the index. And that, that was that. Now it's gonna yell that mark as done isn't implemented, so we need to go do that. So in to-do list, function mark done, we're gonna take in a, so we're gonna to need to change this again. So we're gonna need a mutable reference to self, just like up here because we're gonna be changing the array. And we're gonna to need to take in that index, uh, which is going to be the same type that we have uh, here. So it's gonna be U32. And we're not gonna return anything at all. So in here, what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to go in and change and uh, change this uh, change this type. So we know that it's the toot item and it's completed. So we can say self dot list uh, dot completed is gonna be equal to x. But of course, it's not just self list. It's gonna be self dot list of index. Now. Here's where it's saying the trait bound U32 is not uh, satisfied. Slice indices are of type U size or ranges of U size. So it's saying, hey, you have a U32 number, but it needs to be a U size number. Okay, well, I could just go around and change, like just change it right here. Uh, but what if I just change this to U size? That would work, except down here, I'm uh, this index is u32. This index is a u32. Well, let's come up to the enum and change this to a u size. A u size is just a special, uh, just a type of uh, unsigned uh, number integer. Um, uh, hey, Kaizen, and then. Um, then is there any other areas that I need to worry about? Where do we assign this? Oh, because we're parsing and we're not telling it what to go into, it's parsing it directly into a U size. So everything should just work. Let's uh let's try it. We're going to cargo run get. We have zero and one. If I do cargo run uh what do I call it? Done and one. Well, a bunch of you said hi to CJ earlier, so I'll just do zero. Cargo run done zero, and absolutely nothing happened. So let's uh, let's take a look at what what went wrong here. So we got the command; it's in done. 
um, you know what the problem is? I need to print this at the end to actually see the difference results. Otherwise, it works, but then we don't see the uh, the result of it. So at the end of here, we do need a semicolon. We're going to do a to-do list dot print. And we'll just run this again. And now we get say hi to CJX. All right, so mark a task is complete. Unmark a task. Well, this is going to be the exact same, right? Except the exact opposite. So this time, uh, if we have, if it's marked done, then uh, then we can sort of like undo that. We could we could do a quick uh, a check here. So in mark done. So where's mark done? Mark done. We can do a quick. Uh, if here. So if our self dot list of index dot completed, if this is equal to an X, or rather if this is just a space, then we're going to want to set set it to x, else self.list of index dot completed and uh, set it to a space. And we'll want to semicolon these because we're not returning anything. And so this should automatically give us a uh, mark uh, done. So let's, let's test that out. So we have done zero. Now I realize we have a problem. We don't have one that's already done. So let's uh, let's add another. We can in fact say, okay, we already have do something with Rust. Let's mark that as done too. So to do list dot mark done, and we want to add one to that. So if we just do a get. This is our normal, our normal list that we get right away, and we want to done one, and it undoes it for us. So perfect. We now have the ability to uh, to unmark a task too, and this is where Rust is really nice. Once we've set up all of this stuff, um, the implementations, the uh, the structures, the enums, adding new features becomes a lot easier for us. Does Rust have a Q ternary operator? Um, it has an if expression, uh, which is sort of like an inline if statement. Uh, you call that like a let if, and then just go on from there. Uh, I haven't used it too much because I end up just using match a lot. So like let let variable name equals match. Uh, but it definitely can be can be done. Any embedded devices support Rust? A ton of them, yes. Although a, a lot of times what you do is you just compile your source code to the target of the embedded device, or if it's a Raspberry Pi, you just run, uh, you just run whatever operating system and compile for that. And that's caught up with chat. All right, removing a task, okay. We're, uh, we're almost to the end here. Removing a task. So what do we need to do here to remove a task? Well, it's gonna be the same commands that we have to add for that. And then all we're gonna do is sort of delete it from a, uh, a vector. So let's get, every, let's get all the way up to the point where uh, we need to actually do that. So we know we're going to have inside of the implement to list a function for removing something. So function uh, remove, uh, remove task. We know this is going to take a mutable reference to self, and we know it's going to be the index of what we want to remove, and that's going to be a u size. Uh, but other than that, we don't know what we're going to do with this yet. We're not going to return anything. So 
we need to research how to remove something from a vector. So back to Google's with us. So uh, Rust Lang uh, documentation. Let's go straight to the documentation and just look through it there because I think we're gonna be able to find everything we need from there. So we're gonna use the standard library, search for vector, Create STD, I don't think, oh, I don't think I'm gonna run documentation. There are a couple, that, there's a, sometimes it gets a little bit easy to uh, get a little bit lost. Was it, was I there? I need, is it vector with capital V? Power PC sort, that's not what I want. Do I need primitive types? Oh, it's, a uh, vector is not a primitive type. I need a full, Standard. Oh, it's just, it's just a vec. That's the problem. It's not vector, it's a vec. Uh, so standard vec. Here we go. Standard vec vec. It can be a little bit easy to get lost inside of these uh, documentation, but let's see if we can find a method that allows us to delete something from it. So there's swap remove. remove. Here we go. Uh, here's how it's implemented. Removes and returns the element to position. We don't care about returning it. Here's the examples. We have our vector. We want to remove position one, and we have one and three left. So that's exactly what we want, just dot remove. And that, that's it. So we're gonna say self dot list dot remove uh, index. And that's it. That will that will remove it for us. Um, yeah, and Danny, you were saying vec. I didn't see that, but yes, we got it. Uh, okay, so now it's just complaining that uh, we haven't implemented it yet. So let's now go through the entire uh, rigmarole here. We have done. So now we want a remove. This is going to be a u size. In main, uh, we're gonna add this in here too. So it's a, let's, uh, we can call this remove, like, how do, how do I want? Like, there's done, there's delete. Um, I kind of wanna just call this remove for right now, but clearly this is where you might wanna have multiple things do the same command to make it a little bit easier for people, like a one liner, like a one character. So remove is gonna be a command, colon, colon, remove, uh, and it's gonna be arguments of two dot parse and dot expect, and we can say error uh, removing, um, error, convert, error converting, error parsing when removing, error parsing for a remove, and a comma for this next one right here. We have to keep this catch-all at the bottom, otherwise it'll just catch everything and none of these will, will run. All right, so that gets us removed down here. Now command isn't running that remove, so let's, let's do that. Uh, this is a command, remove. Uh, we're gonna get the, not the include, index. And uh, so then we're just gonna do to-do list dot remove task, and we're gonna pass it in the index, and then we can just to-do list dot print. And that should be it, that should, that should let us do it. So let's now remind ourselves what we have. We have zero and one, let's remove this uh, one because, uh, well, we've already done it, apparently. So we're gonna say cargo run, remove, one and it's gone now all we see is the say hi to cj and that is all the features that i had planned for today um and we we got through a whole bunch in fact it's been what uh it's 3 10 we started at one so it's been two hours and 10 minutes uh to do this while i was explaining through it uh rust is a fun language to, to learn and get used to and, and do all this cool
cool stuff with. And then we're gonna we're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, next building these for production. But uh, in case anybody is having um sort of like you're following along, uh, I'm gonna leave this up for right now. It's kind of hard to have all of this up here. Uh, but I'll, I will definitely um, I'll put a link to the code after I put it up on GitHub, and uh, you can. Um, uh, in Discord. So if you join CJ's Discord, I'll put the uh, the link to this there. Uh, and we are, are you able to save it into a database or something else? Absolutely. So Rust uh, has, it's ca very capable of uh, connecting to databases. You could even use databases like Mongo. Uh, there's, there's no reason that you can't uh, deal with JSON in that way. But you can also use Postgres. You could write it to a file. Uh, there's there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, thank you, Phasar. All right, so uh, last thing, because this is completely useless to you and just source code if you want to. You know, we've created a great, wonderful, uh, robust to-do list. We want to now distribute it to our clients and customers and everybody else who wants to use this. And so we need to compile this for them. So we can use this with uh, Cargo also. If we use Cargo-H, we can see our, um, our build uh, is compiled. We've been running it so far, but now we're gonna want to build it. Uh, so I think we can do Cargo help in fact, uh, I'm actually going to switch over to the full, um, let's go, here we are, this is the wrong one, go documents, projects, mine, to do CLI, uh, let's go into the to do CLI, okay, cargo help build. So here's all of the options that we can hand into it. But for example, we want to hand in uh, production. So where, where is that? We want to build it for production. There's examples, test, release, it, release. So build artifacts in release mode with optimizations. So that's what we want, release mode. So we're gonna do cargo build dash dash release. And this is gonna build it out. It, uh, it doesn't run it for us. So instead it's, um, it's gonna put it, and it tells us where to put it, into uh, to do CLI. Let's see, it's not in here, but it's in a place called targets. Let's switch back in here, open up the sidebar, and take a look where we, what it brought us. So in target, uh, release, and here's the uh, to do CLI. If I click on it, uh, it's not gonna show it to us because it's binary. So this is the actual binary that we can use. Now this is mainly good for, I believe, uh, window, um, sorry, not Windows, Unix and, or Linux and, um, well, Intel Linux and maybe Mac, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure about that. Uh, if we want to compile for Windows, uh, we'll have to come out to compile Rust Lang Windows. So that way we can run it just straight off in Windows. Uh, let's see, this is for installing, cross compile. I always forget the exact code, the exact command for it. And I think I may actually have it in my wiki, cross compiling. Oh yeah, I actually have this right here. Um, so this is in, in my wiki that I created in my, uh, my learning Rust repo. Uh, steps to cross compile from Linux. Here's the actual command. Uh, I'm gonna run this because there's some other things that you might need to, uh, to do, but uh, let's run this and see, see what happens. So cargo build for a release and with the target being x86, 64, so 64 bit on x86 platforms, PC, Windows, GNU. 
And we'll run this, and it says, well, uh, okay, fan can't find crate for STD. So we're using stand, uh, the STD um, uh, sort of standard uh, a crate there. And so, okay, well, it can't do that. Uh, well, first of all, we have to rest up target add. So we have to make the we have to make it so that rest up knows that we want to compile to here. So I'm going to install that. While that's installing, add the file config into a new folder dot cargo in the project root with uh, the content. Um, Below. Okay, so add the file config into a new folder dot cargo. So this is uh, this is done here. So let's um, here go this. Let's create a dot. Is it dot cargo? Yeah. So we want m mkdr dot cargo cd into dot cargo. And we want to now, that's just straight vim into, is just called config. And we'll paste this in here. Uh, this is basically saying, hey, when we're targeting uh, I686 or x86-64, uh, uh, this is the linkers that we want to use. Okay, so now let's try anything else that we need to do. Uh, install the package Ming W W64. So I want to show you what the error that you get without this. Also, this last time I did this was on um, 17 version for Ubuntu. Uh, maybe we don't need this anymore. Let's find out. So we're going to run the compilation again. And let's see if we built successfully. Uh, linker was not found, so unfortunately we do need to uh, we do need to install this. So we're gonna sudo apt install. Now this command only works for Debian based systems, so I'm running on Ubuntu, which is based upon Debian. Yes, I do want to proceed. Uh, yes, I am on 18.10 now. Uh, looks like this is going to take a little bit of time. Um, but uh, uh, tell me, um, how do you like the idea of Rust? Are, are any of you interested in taking a look into Rust now? Yeah, so some of these uh, packages are a lot. Also, like I haven't installed very much, so it looks like it's installing tons of other stuff. Oh, but here it is. It's coming down quicker now. All right, let's try this again. Cargo build release. Ah, and it finished and optimized the target. So if we now come back into our application, we have in release, uh, we'll notice that we have release that we just did, but now we also have the x8664. And this is where we compiled into. So we can see here's our to do cli.exe. So I could give this to uh, anybody running Windows, and they can just double click on it and it'll run. So it won't, it won't matter for them. And that is, I have too many windows open. So close the sidebar, let's close the terminal. That is for Linux and Windows. And I believe Mac, but if it doesn't run on Macs, then you may need to like install a linker and uh, then compile, cross compile for that too. But basically cross compilation is very easy to do on Rust uh, as long as you have the right libraries installed. Um, 
You haven't had so much fun learning a new language before. You had some language experience already. Awesome. Well, I hope that uh, I hope that sort of like you can get back into that, Edgar. Uh, so basically, that's that's the full end of uh, this tutorial. And uh, I do have some challenges for you. Uh, if you want to look into uh, Rust yourself, what you could do is start from this code that I have. And uh, instead of taking the user input from arguments, run an infinite loop and ask the user for their command every iteration. Um, another challenge is implement a command for changing the task description. So that would be like, okay, well, I miswrote it in. I want to change the writing, like the words in it. And implement a custom sort command. So it's not always just in the order that we added it, but maybe like you could also add in what, um, uh, what priorities you have, like A, B, and C, and then always show uh, all the A priorities first, then the B, then the C. Uh, you don't need any more items on your uh, things to learn list. Yeah, I could I could totally see that. Um, I, I have tons of those items too. That's the reason why I'm not learning Golang or other things. Uh, I'm just learning um, I'm just learning Rust stuff for right now. But uh, any any other questions? CJ came back, so we can mark off. Say hi to CJ again. Well, um, I am on Discord, and uh, hey, Cass, great seeing you. Um, although you caught me at the end, uh, I'm on Discord. I'm, uh, you may have seen me, you know, hanging out there a little bit before. Uh, I don't really have like so much, t so much time to like constantly be on it all the time. But um, if you ping me out there, I will definitely be happy to sort of like join the help back end with Rust. I might create a, um, uh, I might ask uh, CJ to create a, a Rust, um, like a help Rust on there. But that's if you guys are open to me to doing more str streams here, I would be perfectly happy to. Otherwise, uh, I do have my own stream on Twitch in which I do a lot of uh, Rust stuff there. So you could also catch me, catch me uh, on Twitch. Um, which front end web frameworks would I recommend? Uh, front end, like, well, anyone that you like. Uh, coding, uh, coding Garden loves Vue. Um, I personally use uh, React um, at work and Angular but I, I prefer React. You want to try something new? Um, if you want to use a front-end framework, just uh, try one of the big three or Mavo. Um, that would be cool. But uh, ask me on Discord and I'll, I could uh, give you some links. Oh, and CJ uh, put a link to my... Um, to my uh, Twitch stream. Uh, and in fact, I don't have anything else, so I'm gonna switch over to my standard ending stream. You've only used uh, vanilla before. Uh, vanilla is really awesome to use, and if you really want to, like, um, React might be a good next step for that because it uses a lot of vanilla JavaScript mixed in with uh, whatever React that you end up using. Uh, what I have, um, I've got my ending stream up on stream, so I've got links to my GitHub. Uh, I've got links to my uh, Twitch TV account that's also in the chat. And over at uh, Twitter, I always uh, tweet out when I'm going to be streaming uh, and also if I'm going to miss one of my standard uh, streams. Uh, currently, my schedule is to stream every weekday morning at uh, 7 a.m. Mountain Time, which is uh, minus 6 GMT. Uh, so I'll be back online tomorrow morning. That's sort of like a, a warm up um, for the day, sort of getting my mind um, up and, and going. So it's random projects or anything else that I feel like. So I have no idea what I'm gonna be coding on tomorrow.
But with that, I'm uh, I'm going to sign off. So I hope that you all had a great Sunday. And uh, for those of you who are going to join me on my stream tomorrow morning, uh, I look forward to seeing you. Other than that, have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, we'll see you on Discord or the next CJ stream. See ya. Bye.